Last episode, we began by explaining that the old nursery rhyme, What Are People Made Of?, was a bit complicated when it came to trying to work out the ingredients and instructions for actually making the sorts of people outlined in the recipes. In particular, we laid a load of unexplained blame on girls who were made of sugar and spice and everything nice. Both because everything nice was a potentially infinite, unlimited list of undefined things, and because if you were going to throw spice into the mix, you were signing up for a load of other problems that had very little to do with things nice and a lot to do with things we rather wish hadn't been in the first place. Furthermore, we followed up with the assertion that there was just too darn much pumpkin spice running around in the world. From lattes to liniments, TP to just tea, the surfeit of pumpkin spice infused products was getting to be a bit much especially as it was tied mostly to wringing as much money out of people as possible, whether or not it actually added any value to the products involved. Turns out, we weren't alone. Several people wrote in to tell us they were glad we were finally exposing pumpkin spice for what it was, a gimmick. Yet another in the long list of fads and manufactured traditions designed only to further pad the pockets of those who had trouble sitting down due to the amount of padding already in their pockets, all from the unpadded pockets of the general gullible public. Of course, most of those who wrote in to say they agreed with us overlooked one thing we also mentioned, which is that we liked pumpkin spice. After all, we wouldn't have purchased seasonally appropriate pumpkin spiced doggy treats for number one dog if we didn't, would we? Certainly not. Well, probably not. After all, we also got her turducken dog food, even though no one has sent us a turducken of our own yet. Or a chipumple. It's been years and nothing. Very disappointing. But we digress. The point is, we like that combination of spices collectively known as pumpkin pie spice. We just think it mostly belongs in actual pumpkin pies, and not everything at this time of year has to taste or smell like a pumpkin pie to be good. After all, we don't demand everything smell and taste like peppermint at Christmas, or chalky compressed sugar candy hearts at Valentine's Day, or pine trees on Arbor Day. It's excessive, and the more you're exposed to such things, the less impact they have the next time you encounter them, until eventually they don't affect you at all, and you're ready to line up for the next thing. Probably some sort of mashed potatoes and gravy mochaccino or something. But this sort of thing, as we pointed out last time, is not unique to this time and this place. No indeed. In fact, it was exactly this sort of manic craze for new flavors and scents that knocked the world topsy-turvy centuries ago and harmed the lives of so many unprepared cultures that many of them have yet to recover and probably never will. It's not a stretch to say that the obsession with spice from way, way back in history is still having a massive effect on things today, especially if you happen to live in Manhattan. But before we get that far, let's take a step back and acknowledge that old truism of inevitability and remember that in spite of our best efforts, it was probably all going to turn out this way anyhow. After all, as someone once said, the spice must flow. In flow it has. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The thing about the spice trade is that it is another one of those human activities that goes so far back in time that no one really knows where or how it began. Who first decided that the shaved bark of a tree was a good thing to add to food? Who figured out that if you scraped off the outer coating, you could use the hard center of a particular fruit as a dessert topping. And what genius worked out that you could take the ugly, wrinkly, muddy, underground bit of an otherwise unremarkable plant, slice it very thin, and then serve it with sushi, and no one would necessarily die every time you did it. No one knows who these culinary pioneers were, where they were from, or what strange set of circumstances led them to these remarkable discoveries. All we do know is that by the Neolithic period, trade in spices and other high-value commodities was well underway, and by the third millennium, the Egyptians were trading with a place called Punt and keeping written records of it. At first, all this trading took place overland, which wasn't the most convenient way to get at the really good stuff. The reason being 
the really good stuff, including most of your pumpkin spices, was all located across the water on a bunch of islands off the coast of Southeast Asia. It wasn't until some folks referred to as the Austronesian-speaking peoples got around to inventing ocean-going boats that things really began to pick up. The Austronesian peoples is the collective term for the groups of people found in Madagascar, maritime Southeast Asia, Micronesia, coastal New Guinea, Polynesia, and Taiwan. They all speak related languages, have many similar cultural characteristics, and seem to have come from what is now Taiwan way back around 3000 to 1500 BCE. They probably first reached the northernmost Philippines and spread out across the Pacific from there, maybe even onto the far off shores of the American continent. Initially, of course, they didn't have seaworthy vessels and had to rely a lot on currents to carry their rafts and floats to new locations. And probably a lot of that occurred more or less accidentally when brave pioneers were caught out in storms or during periods of low sea level when the crossings might not have been so difficult. However, one can't always count on helpful changes in the climate and the convenient appearance of craft-propelling weather to spread a population. Which is why the Austronesians became the first people to develop ocean-going craft worthy of the name, catamarans and outriggers. It's fairly easy to see the progression from raft to outrigger canoe. Picture in your head the stereotypical raft. Eight or nine logs lashed together next to each other. Now, pretend you were tired of getting your feet wet every time a wave higher than two inches came along. You might get the bright idea to lift the raft out of the water a bit by attaching two more logs, probably hollowed out a bit, underneath and perpendicular to the first set of logs. That way the whole thing floats a little higher in the water. In fact, probably you'd work out that dugout canoes would be really good for this purpose, and so you'd attach canoes under your raft instead. And then someone else, because you can't have all the glory to yourself, can you? Someone else would work out that if you attach the canoes to the sides of the raft, not only would folks be a lot drier, but you'd also be able to steer the thing by putting people with paddles inside the canoes. So your double canoe and raft setup suddenly becomes a catamaran. Stick a post with a bit of cloth on it in the middle for a sail, and away you go. Now, the reason you haven't gone to sea properly in your canoes on your own anyway is because as anyone who owns a canoe can tell you, the things are pretty easy to tip over in the wrong sort of weather and rough seas. But this catamaran idea sure does make them more stable. But you might wonder, was the raft part entirely necessary if you weren't planning to bring lots of supplies or the relatives with you on your fishing expedition? Probably not. Maybe you could just attach two canoes to each other with a couple of poles and call it good. And as it turns out, you could. And it did work pretty well. In fact, it almost didn't matter if the two canoes were the same size or not, or if one of them was even a real canoe and not just a more or less hydrodynamically shaped floating log. Although, if you put the canoe in the middle of two floating logs attached by poles, you certainly had all the stability you wanted, in addition to a lighter, faster, ocean-going craft, the outrigger canoe. And suddenly, the world was your oyster. You could use the catamarans for hauling people and cargo, and the outrigger canoes for hunting and scouting expeditions. Might as well load things up and see who you could find and what they might want out of your stuff in exchange for some of their stuff. You know, like these spices you've got all over the place. Which is, more or less, what they did. By 1500 BCE, the Austronesians had established trade routes with India and Sri Lanka and connected them with other trade routes they established with China. Through these trade routes passed the boats of the Austronesians as well as coconuts, sandalwood, bananas, sugarcane, cinnamon, and its cousin cassia. Which, by the way, is what you usually get in your grocery store. Cassia, not cinnamon. Even though cassia is labeled cinnamon, which it isn't. Similar flavors and smells, but cassia is only related to cinnamon and is therefore much less expensive. Especially if all you're going to do is grind it into a powder and sprinkle it over your cocoa. In any case, this trade network gradually expanded until it reached as far as Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, and then to Madagascar, which the Austronesian people were happy to colonize when they found it. This entire interconnected series of islands and trade routes is now referred to as the Maritime Silk Road. And if you aren't sure why that should be the case, go back to our episode on Marco Polo and go on from there. 
By the first millennium BCE, everyone was getting on the trading, thanks in part to the seagoing craft the Austronesians had been willing to trade. It wasn't long before other folks were copying the designs and making little improvements here and there, until the Arabs, Phoenicians, and Indians were all at sea happily trading goods back and forth with each other and anyone else who hadn't worked out how to get a sail up and paddle around the ocean. In even less time than you can say grand chai tea latte three-pump skim milk half-whip hot, the spices and other goods on offer were making their way by ocean up the Red Sea, overland to the Nile, and straight into Alexandria. Meanwhile, Arab tribes had taken over the former land routes, and soon everyone was in on the spice trade. Even the Greeks, once they learned how to sail, got in on the act and soon had control of the sea trade in the Red Sea area. By the first century CE, anyone who was anyone was making big money trading spices in and around the known world. Everyone had their piece of the pie, but some people had bigger pieces than others. The Arabs, in large part the main suppliers to the West, went to great lengths to protect their supplies. As discussed last episode, they weren't above fabricating completely fantastic tales about how spices were obtained in order to protect the true origins and how ridiculously easy it was to get some with only a little effort. And often, that effort amounted to little more than simply showing up and asking if they could have some. Which is pretty much what they did with nutmeg. The tiny island of Bandis, until the 19th century, was the only place in the world you could get nutmeg. Like, all of it in the entire world. It all came from there. But everyone wanted it. And by everyone, we mean everyone. Which, because you've learned about supply and demand before now, meant that it was very, very expensive. For hundreds of years, nutmeg was more valuable than gold. At least, on one end of the exchange. See, on Bandas itself, you could buy 10 pounds of nutmeg for the equivalent of one-eighth of a song and hardly any dance at all. Less than a penny for 10 pounds. On Bandas. Hardly even worth mentioning. But in Europe, well, in Europe, that 10-pound sack would sell for just over two British pounds. And for those of you unfamiliar with the goofball system of old English money, just go with a profit of over 60 thousand percent. A man could make his fortune quite easily with very little effort and a very small initial investment just by buying nutmeg in the Bandus and selling it in Europe. So lots of people did. Nutmeg starts out as a little green apricot looking fruit hanging on a tree. A groove runs along the side of the fruit which eventually splits to reveal, well craziness really, it reveals a red webbing covering a brown pit, the actual nutmeg, at the center of the fruit's yellowish flesh. You can probably throw away the flesh of the fruit, but save everything else, including that red webbing. Dry out the webbing, which is called an arrow, grind it up, and you have yet another spice, which we call mace. It tastes like nutmeg, but is a bit more delicately flavored, and it gets used in a lot of pickling and preserving. The nutmeg itself is where the real money is. The name nutmeg comes from two Latin words, nux meaning nut and muscat meaning musky, which we suppose is an accurate enough description. Mace, and by extension nutmeg, have been written about and therefore known about since at least our old friend Pliny the Elder in the first century CE, and by this point you'd be forgiven for thinking that that is certainly a long time to be scraping nutmeg over your desserts. And you'd be right, if that's what people were actually doing with it. It wasn't though. In fact, one of the chief uses for nutmeg was as a deodorant. Take a nutmegger five and place them in your clothes chest to at least make all your clothes smell of nutmeg. Put it in a bag around your neck to make you smell of nutmeg. In fact, put nutmeg anywhere you didn't want to smell what things actually smelled like for a few hundred years when bathing in personal hygiene wasn't such a much. You'll prefer the nutmeg every time. But that wasn't all. Put some nutmeg in your ale, not because it made it taste better, which it probably did anyway, but because nutmeg was known to make drinks safer to drink. This is because nutmeg has antimicrobial effects, though of course people didn't know that's what it was back then, against 25 different types of bacteria, including E. coli, which is what made it so popular as a preservative and an embalming agent in ancient Egypt. Nutmeg was also good against a variety of Staphylococcus and the bacteria that causes thrush. Also, if you were a gentleman not particularly gifted when it came to getting fair maidens to look at your etchings for any length of time, 
Nutmeg was said to be a great friend to those trying to make an impression, as it were. And if your etchings proved to be quite effective, the lady in question might turn to the services of a nutmeg lady for access to an organic compound called saffron, which can be extracted from the nutmeg and which, in addition to being an effective insecticide, was capable of producing the sort of effect in pregnant women that gets argued about in Texas these days, if you take our meaning. But really, one of the chief reasons nutmeg was one of the more popular and profitable spices is that it is also a narcotic. Taken in sufficient quantities, it produces an effect not entirely unlike marijuana. But, let us caution you right now, this is not at all recommended. It takes a lot of nutmeg to get the effect, but it only takes a lot of nutmeg plus a tiny bit more nutmeg for it to become potentially lethal. Best not to even toy with the idea. It wasn't until the 1600s that nutmeg really took off as a flavoring for foods. Nutmeg needs to be grated to be effective, and this began a fad in the 18th and 19th centuries for the well-to-do to pack around a nutmeg and a small pocket-sized nutmeg grater, all tricked out in the usual manner of those with more style than substance. Freshly grated nutmeg soon became an essential addition to both wine and ale, as well as sweetened port and the venerable hot toddy. Meanwhile, back on the little island of Bandus, things weren't going so well. The first westerner to reach the island was a Venetian called Ludovico di Verathima. In 1510, he published an account of his many adventures, in which he referred to the Bandus islanders as beasts and pagans who had no king or governor and who were so stupid they wouldn't even know how to do evil if they wished to. Which is an odd thing to note about anyone, seemingly civilized or not, as if doing evil was the whole point of being smart. This encouraged the Portuguese to sail for the Bandus the following year, and upon arrival, the commander of the expedition filled the holes of his three small ships to the top with nutmeg and mace before sailing right back. Then in 1603, James Lancaster, who would later help found the Dutch East India Company, arrived and started claiming islands left and right for England, which lasted just as long as it took the Dutch to get fed up with anyone else having access to the lucrative nutmeg supply they had carefully cornered the market on previously. They sailed in and leveled the warehouses and processing plants, and then, just to be sure no one else could have any nutmeg but them, destroyed all the nutmeg trees which gave the Dutch the monopoly and let them set any price they wanted and control the supply. And since the Dutch didn't feel like they particularly needed any of the natives for anything that wasn't producing nutmeg, they either enslaved, massacred, or transported elsewhere much of the local population. 44 of the native chiefs were killed and replaced by planters whose only job it was to run the plantations. Then the Dutch had a big war with the English in 1665, which ended in the Treaty of Breda. Under the terms of the treaty, the English decided they didn't really want the tiny little group of islands known as the Moluccas that they'd been fighting so hard for after all, which included the Bandus, and the Dutch could have them. The Dutch were quite pleased to hear this, and as a parting gift gave the English some crummy little island they owned that was just about as far away from anything useful as they could manage which is how the English ended up in control of a place called New Amsterdam, or as we know it today, Manhattan Island. Thankfully, the English didn't mind the Dutch making all the money in the world thanks to nutmeg. No, sorry, they did mind, and in 1810, English commandos raided the islands and forced the Dutch to surrender everything they owned there. And so the English started making all the big money themselves, and then seven years later, they gave it all back to the Dutch. Well, we say all, but really, the all that they gave back to the Dutch was minus all the money-making bits. The English went through and destroyed all the nutmeg trees, saving a few hundred nutmeg seedlings for themselves, which they sailed off and transplanted to English colonies in Ceylon, Singapore, and Grenada, where they did just fine, thank you very much. Enjoy your islands, Dutchies. By the time the Bandus Islands recovered, the monopoly was broken, and world nutmeg trade was still profitable but not nearly as much as it had been when there was but a single source. 
And this is essentially the story with the other now common spices that make up your typical batch of pumpkin pie spice. Nutmeg, cinnamon, allspice, cloves, and ginger all started out in quiet little corners of the world being traded locally. Eventually, someone outside gets wind of them, and soon the demand for a given spice becomes so great that huge profits are to be made by buying as cheaply as possible and selling for as much as you can. Then the big players show up, subdue the natives because they're an unnecessary part of the process, and take over until nearly the whole thing is run into the ground. Eventually, someone manages to break the monopoly and spread the spice to new places far and wide. The price comes down as the supply grows, and the profits are not quite so dear. Everything sort of levels out eventually, and everyone is happy with their eventual little piece of the pie. Well, everyone except the original natives, who are usually either dead, or enslaved, or, frequently, both. What does it all mean? Well, we don't know. We just thought that the pumpkin spice everything craze looked suspiciously similar to a craze that happened a few hundred years ago. And since all these things, huge profits and poor behavior alike, are driven by over-the-top demand both then and now, maybe there's something to learn from that. Maybe. In the meantime, see you next year. Thank you for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We hope your holiday plans, whatever they may be, are both fun and comforting. This is the last new episode for the year for us, but don't fear. Like last year, we are preparing two special packages of bonus episodes for December to wrap up our year. They'll be longer than the usual episode, so you'll have a lot to keep you company until the new year. And by a curious quirk of the calendar, the second bonus episode, the last of the year, will also be our 300th episode. So feel free to celebrate that with an extra candy cane or whatever you have handy. We'll be sitting quietly at home with a mug of tea and a good book, probably. GM Word of the Week is, and has been for 300 episodes, supported by our generous listeners who have made every single episode of the show possible, both by listening and sharing, and with much appreciated financial support as well. If you've gotten even one episode of value out of us, please consider heading over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and becoming a member. For as little as $5 a month, you can get transcripts and early episode releases. Heck, you'll know what episode 301 is about before everyone else. Buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback. Check out The Book of Spice from an East to Zetoary by John O'Connell. It's an interesting encyclopedic reference work that tells the story of every spice, even the ones you've never heard of. GM Word of the Week is a Fiddleback production and is researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Happy Holidays.